Welcome this afternoon. I'm so delighted you can make it. It's great to see a full house today. My name is Garth Amundsen. I teach in the art department, and you are officially part of our visiting lecture series. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, as I said, I teach in the art department, and my job here today is to introduce my, you to my collaborator, JL from the VU Gallery, who will in turn formally introduce our guest of honor, Den Cule. Um, I want to say I met Den uh, in one of the most beautiful places in the world at the Rockefeller Foundation in Bellagio on Lake Como. It's, it's almost like Bellingham. <laughs> but after being a fan of his work for many years, and I've always wanted to invite him here to Western, I'm thrilled that we have him here today. Also, one of my duties and tasks is to thank all of our many sponsors, which this would not happen without the following people. Of course, the Department of Art and Art History, we'd be lost without you. The Associated Students donated and contributed not only time, sweat, but money. Uh, the VU Gallery, of course. The Diversity Fund, the LGBT Advocacy Council. Kit Spicer, our loyal dean from the uh, CFPA. I don't know if he's here today, but um, great contributor and great to have his support. The Center for International Studies and the Center for East Asian Studies. Thank you for all of the support. If we can have a round of applause for them, that would be great. Thank you so much. Also, I would be remiss without thanking Elizabeth Leach, who couldn't be with us today. I had lunch with her yesterday. She has a gallery in, in uh, Portland, and she so generously uh, donated, well, loaned, I wish she would donate, loaned the work for the exhibition, which is on view at the Viking Union Gallery. Please join us for the reception immediately following the lecture today in the Viking Union Gallery at 5.30. The reception is free and open to the public. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague and uh, collaborator, J.L. Gazbat. <laughs> Thank you, Garth. It is truly an honor to have Din Kuli speaking here on Western's campus. I had the fortune to spend some time with Din yesterday, and he is truly a remarkable man. I'm continually uh, captivated by the way in which his work explores how identities, both individual and cultural, um, are built. So Din was born in Ha Tien, Vietnam in 1968. He arrived in the Americas in 1979 as a refugee. He earned his BA from UC Santa Barbara, attended the School of Visual Arts in New York and earned his MFA. He then moved back to Vietnam and now resides in Ho Chi Minh City. Din's work has been included in the Venice Biennale in 2003, the Asia Pacific Triennial in 2006, and the Asian Art Biennial in 2012. His work is also included in many permanent collections such as the Museum of Modern Art, the Ford Foundation, and the Queensland Gallery of Modern Art. Din has recently also had several solo shows, one at the Mori Art Museum in Tokyo, and one at 10 Chancery Lane Gallery in Hong Kong. And of course, his most recent exhibition in the Viking Union Gallery. Just without further ado, that I introduce you to Din Q. Lee. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for coming. It's quite beautiful out there, so I'm sorry you have to be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much, Garth, and the school for inviting me here. Um, I, I live in Vietnam, so uh, it's really kind of strange sometimes uh, to think that people actually know what I do. Uh, I'm very, uh, most of the time, uh, I'm completely uh, sort of away from the art world. Um, when, when Garth uh, and Pierre was in uh, uh, Bellagio, and they said that they know of my work. And I was like, what? <laughs> so so uh, it's, it's always really nice to be, uh, uh, to, to know that there are people out there in the world follow what I do. Um, but living in Vietnam also have its own perk. Uh, I'm so, in many ways, so far away from the art world that uh, it leave me a lot of freedom, a lot of uh, room to sort of work and not feel the pressure of the art world all the time. Um, 
which is uh, a luxury, I think, today uh, with the, uh, you know, the biennial, the triennial, the art fair are constant uh, um, demand on you as an artist. Um, and so uh, it's amazing that you can actually have a career living in places like Vietnam where there's no, not really much contemporary art uh, and it's still a communist country. So uh, anyway, so that's sort of the context of where I am. Um, I will talk a little bit about some of the work over the, the years I've done um, and the journey to get to where I am today. It's, a, it's, a, it's kind of an interesting journey. And I was um, telling Quentin today that uh, uh, most of the time when I talk, I'm, or when I'm uh, attending a talk, by another artist. I'm always interested in how an artist could go from point A to point B rather than about the work themselves. Because I think that journey is very interesting and it's informed uh, the work and, and, and it's, um, it's that journey that I'm kind of always curious how, uh, what an artist has to do to get to, you know, from one place to another. So, um, so my work was sort of kind of focused on, on, on that journey and how it get from, you know, I, I was here in, 19, in 1990, I guess in 1990, uh, 1989 when I finished my undergrad and pretty much starting showing pretty much uh, in 1990. 89, and I was quite young at that time, um, to giving it all up, going back to Vietnam, disappear for a while, and then the art world sort of, dis sort of discover me again. And so uh, I will talk about all of that. Um, so starting with this work, this is 1996, starting, um, I have moved back to Vietnam now, uh, a couple of years now. Um, I was here, I did my, my graduate uh, at SBA in 19, uh, I think I finished in 1991. And I was showing, uh, I was picked up by a gallery, pretty much while I was in graduate school. Um, but I, I was 21 years old. I was way too young for, I was not ready for that craziness. Um, so uh, I finished school and then I pulled out of the gallery. I thought I moved to Boston. Uh, that would be um, far away enough, but it was not enough, so I moved back to Vietnam. Uh, and that was the 90, so from 97, 94, 94 to 96, uh, I have to go back and forth between America and Vietnam uh, because um, um, I, I didn't know how to earn a living in Vietnam yet. Uh, so 90, uh, until 97, then um, a, another gallery in America, Elizabeth Leach, uh, in Portland, Oregon, picked me up and they, she starts selling, so I was able to live in Vietnam. But, um, the journey has been interesting because uh, when I was here, um, I was looking a lot of learning about the history of the Vietnam War because so much of it has influenced the way uh, the world or America see me. And, um, but uh, I think, so when I, I was doing a lot of kind of looking at all that history, um, and then decided to move back to Vietnam and continue to do that research. But uh, it was quite difficult to start because I think it was too close. To, uh, and so what I did was I went around it. And so the, the, the first work when I moved back to Vietnam I, that I did uh, was the Cambodia Splendor and Darkness. And uh, one of the reasons why I was going to Cambodia was because 
Uh, my family used to live uh, along the border between Vietnam and Cambodia, and we were under attack by the Khmer Rouge. Um, I'm not going to go into that history because it's quite long, but basically the Khmer Rouge uh, took over Cambodia in, 19, in the late, uh, in the mid-70s, uh, in 1975, and uh, sort of set out a program that uh, pretty much killed around four millions of their own people uh, through torture, starvation, um, and um, so they were next door to my home and eventually they invaded my hometown. And so I was trying to go back there. Uh, when I went back there, the first, I thought I, I need to go to Cambodia to sort of learn about that history. And that came out of this work called um, Cambodia Splendor and Darkness. And uh, so these, what, what you see up there is um, the portraits of the people that were killed by the Khmer Rouge. Uh, that um, they were uh, arrested, documented, and tortured until they confessed to working for some crazy like the CIA or the KGB um, that tried to undermine the Khmer Rouge uh, policy. But you know, most of these people are just innocent people who didn't know why they were there. And um, the, the, the background, what you see is uh, these are um, the wall carvings of angles. These are temples that uh, were built in the, uh, I think the 12th, 12th, 13th centuries in Cambodia. And Angkor at that time, and it was one of the most amazing kind of civilization that, that uh, came out of uh, Southeast Asia. And what, so when I visited Cambodia, I, I couldn't, sort of reconcile between here is a country that's capable of this unbelievably beautiful to beauty to build this this amazing um, temple and at the same time they're capable of building of killing four million of their own people different time but at the same time it's the same people and so this this work come out uh, as a kind of um, we're trying to reconcile these two. Uh, I only have this one image here for, from this series. Uh, but um, the, the idea was to try to undermine this temple, this uh, amazing monuments that, that were built by the king, by the, uh, you know, that um, we have a tendency to build monument to uh, celebrate our victories, our achievement, but we very rarely do we build memorial to remember the victims. It was only until after World War II that we start thinking about memorial. And so this, this work, there's a, a series of this work that are uh, create as, as a way to undermine this monument, this temple uh, that were built by the kings. Uh, so the, maybe I should talk a little bit about the techniques. Uh, the photographs are cut into strips. The two photographs, so you have the wall carvings of Angkor, and then you have the portraits. Uh, and they're cut into strips, one vertical and one horizontal, and they're woven together like a tapestry. And uh, so um, I think the what, what I, my approach to photography always have been try taking a look at these images and trying to take them apart and sort of put them together again uh, in ways that make sense to me. So uh, this is one of the early work. Um, and so finally coming back to Vietnam, after a couple of years and I, I felt like I sort of can now deal with Vietnam. Uh, and that history, um, the, the Vietnam War history. Um, I think when I first moved back, 
the subject was so large that I didn't know how to enter it. I didn't know how to deal with it. Um, and so it took a couple of years. And um, I think one of the earliest projects I did was uh, this public project uh, that um, was done um, in, in the city. Uh, now, when I first moved back to Vietnam, there's all these um, people begging for money. And they have, they have some sort of uh, physical deformities. Uh, and this is really early during this time. Um, there was not much help for these people. So I didn't know why there's so many deformed people on the street um, begging. And eventually found out that you know, most of these people were a uh, victim of Agent Orange. Um, either their parents uh, uh, or their grandfather were part of the war. And they were exposed to Agent Orange that were used by the US government during the Vietnam War to defoliate the jungle of Vietnam so they can see the communists underneath uh, the, jung uh, the, the, the trees. And um, Agent Orange, uh, one, of, is one, the, one of the byproduct of Agent Orange is the dioxin. And a, a pinhead drop of it can, if you expose it, it can damage you on a genetic level. So it, it go into your system and it actually change your your genetic makeup and you pass it on to your children and your children pass it on to your grandchildren. So it doesn't stop. It sort of keeps going. And I think uh, now people are able to track uh, uh, Americans, actually, American uh, uh, vets who have grandchildren now that have uh, that experience, uh, that have deformity as a result of their exposure during the Vietnam War as well. So at that time, the Vietnamese government doesn't want to talk about this um, because they didn't know how to talk about it, number one. They didn't know how to talk about soil contamination. They didn't know how to talk about this issue without affecting Vietnam uh, kind of emer emerging ex uh, cultural export. We, at that time, I think, become the third largest rice exporter in the world, as well as uh, second or third largest coffee exporter in the world. So to talk about soil contamination, it might affect our cultural export, our agricultural export. So, um, so the government doesn't talk about it. And then, of course, the US government refused to talk about it. Um, and it was only until, I think, a couple of years, uh, you know, um, maybe not a couple of years ago, but even, even today, the U.S. government's still not willing to recognize uh, um, their response, you know, to accept the responsibility for it. They have given money to cl for cleanup, they have given some money for helping with the victim, but n not kind of publicly acknowledge it. Uh, and actually, one of the people here who know the best, Charles Bailey, uh, who used to be the head of the Ford Foundation in, uh, in Hanoi, as well as uh, uh, spearhead the cleanup effort in Da Nang, as well as uh, uh, other area in Vietnam, who's here, if you can ask him much more, uh, know about this. But so going back to um, this, so America was not willing to talk about it. The Vietnamese government doesn't want to talk about it. And all these people are out there. So what I decided to do was to bring the, the issue public. And by sort of create this object, this souvenirs object, uh, that um, based on the, the, the and open a kiosk. It's a, this is a little kiosk in the open market. And uh, sort of sites tries to sell all these objects for a dollar. Um, so these are some of the ladies who have shops next to my shop. So for one month, we asked uh, 
a lady who had uh, a, a children's clothing shop uh, in the open market to take a vacation. And I moved my stuff in. And uh, we have t-shirts with statistics. Uh, and uh, as well, we make clothing for uh, Sami twins. And uh, the reason, one, one of the reasons why I did this, well, many of the reasons, uh, there are a couple of reasons. One is to bring it out in the public. But at this time, uh, you could not do this project in Vietnam uh, uh, because of censorship. Uh, in Vietnam, even to today, uh, every exhibition in Vietnam, you have to apply per permission from the government to do an exhibition. You have to show them what you're doing, explain what the artwork, and then they say yes or no. And so this work at that time would not be possible. And, but because this shop is under the commerce department, so the cultural department have no control over it. And at that time, the commerce department was perfectly okay with my shop. So, so we just went ahead and opened the shop. And so we, we make all of this stuff. And uh, what's, what was interesting is that um, it was also a taboo subject. Uh, the um, the um, uh, deformity, uh, the, the people wouldn't talk about it. Um, the women were afraid if they talk about it, they would give birth to one. So uh, all this clothing that um, at first I, would, I approached some of the seamstress to try to make the work and uh, they all turned me down. Eventually figured out why and so we asked older women, the women be beyond a childbearing age to, to, to make the work. And then it was okay. And so, um, and so we, we showed the work and about half of the people walked by and refused to look at it. But uh, eventually, you know, somebody stopped and the conversation began. And that was kind of really interesting uh, it, it led to another body of work that uh, out of those conversations, but I'm, I'm not showing it here. Uh, this is later on. They've been traveling around the world a bit now, this project. This is in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, Australia will also experience uh, this problem too because they were part of the uh, coalition that fought in Vietnam with the U.S. government as well. So. I think the, this work started with a very kind of interesting um, experience that I had in Simi Valley, California. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Simi Valley, Reagan country, late Reagan library. Uh, my mom lives there. I actually, when I was uh, from 10 to uh, college age, I lived there. And um, so I moved back to Vietnam now, and I visited my mom there. And um, there was a fire in the, the, the hillside. And the sm smoke was everywhere, that kind of orange smoke. And um, the helicopters were flying around, dropping fi uh, water on the, um, the fires. And I remember walking out at the backyard and looking at the sky and listen to the helicopter. And I thought, the first thing I thought was, wow, this is like the Vietnam War. Um, and then, of course, I catch myself because my memory of Vietnam doesn't have helicopters. I, I live in a place that have, uh, uh, during the Vietnam War, that have very little helicopter, kind of. And I realized that the memory I'm, that's kind of coming up in my head is from apocalypse now. <laughs> uh, it, it's not, you know, my personal experience. So, uh, so I was kind of interested in that and looking at that in terms of asking, where is my memory of the Vietnam War today? Uh, when I was in college, I want to understand the Vietnam War. I want to learn about the Vietnam War. So I was looking at a lot of documentary images, uh, um, documentary um, films, and then you know there's personal memory. 
uh, as a child uh, living in Vietnam during the war. And then coming to America, of course, you, uh, I had to watch all those Vietnam War movies that come out in the 90s uh, because uh, I have to see what, how America see me. Uh, and so, so it was interesting to start thinking about all this, all this kind of three separate set of memories that start merging into one another. And they, they sort of construct, uh, create this new set of memory that are neither fact nor fiction. So here what you have is uh, images of, from Hollywood, from personal uh, family photographs, uh, from documentary images. They're all kind of merging in and out of one another. Uh, the, the Hollywood images are much more dominant uh, because they, they do dominate, uh, dominate our memory of the Vietnam War. And, um, so these are about uh, about a meter, a meter two by about a meter eight. Sorry, <laughs> I don't. I, I've been in Vietnam too long. I don't remember feet and uh, you know uh, the, the other stuff anymore. So, uh, so these are also photo weavings. Uh, maybe I'll I'll tell you a little bit about how the photo weavings came about. Also. Uh, my aunt used to do grass mat weaving, and as a child, I sort of watched her do it and sort of learn along the way. So, uh, along the way, I sort of kind of used this as a, a method of merging and weaving all this separate kind of set of memories and, and um, uh, images together. Um, after making that body of work, uh, Looking at a lot of kind of photo, uh, uh, looking at a lot of uh, Hollywood films, uh, I start thinking about in terms of three dimensions uh, about film, about narratives, also. But I think maybe before that, even before that, um, I uh, also started. Um, um, I set up a nonprofit organization in LA. Uh, to support uh, Vietnamese, young Vietnamese artists, and then eventually open a, a nonprofit gallery called San Art in Vietnam, because I felt there was a need to provide a platform for, for these young artists to show that, showcase their work, to experiment, and to have a, uh, their voice being heard, because at that time, this is uh, about eight years ago, nine years ago, um, new form like video, uh, installation, conceptual work are not recognized in Vietnam. You still have, in Vietnam, even today, 90% of the artists are traditional painters and sculptors. So I want to create a platform where to allow, to give these young artists a place so they can speak and they can and I think operating that place for about three years now, we, we have a full-time director running it now. Uh, it changed the way I work also. Um, the idea to create platform to get a place for people to speak, uh, for their voice to be heard, kind of changed the way I'm thinking about making work again. So with this work, what I end up was to create a film with, uh, with these objects uh, that um, uh, this, uh, this helicopter was made by these two guys. So maybe I'll, I'll tell a little bit stories about. Um, so these two guys, that are far, one is a self-taught mechanic and one is a, um, a farmer. The tall one is the, the self-taught mechanic. And uh, he, they have a shop fixing farming equipment in the middle of nowhere. Um, I found out that they, they make these crazy helicopters. And um, so I went there to find out why. 
because you know, you know we uh, <laughs> uh, knowing that the the, the, his, the Vietnam War is one of the first uh, helicopter war, and knowing that the helicopter is such an iconic image of the Vietnam War, uh, iconic object of the Vietnam War, that um, that I wanted to sort of kind of go there and meet this guy and see them their kind of understanding of this object that they're making. And so so this is one of their first helicopter made from scratch. It's actually a live size helicopter. We're not talking about some small toys here. Um, and the reason why they want to make this helicopter was for farming for emergency evacuation, some cheap helicopter that we can afford uh, to, to do it. And, um, but at the same time, you know, there was all this discussion about why, but nobody talked about how this helicopter came to Vietnam. How did they, you know, how did it enter this guy's mind? And so uh, this was uh, installed at MoMA. Uh, they actually own this helicopter and the film now. Um, and uh, so I went and I met them and uh, decided to make a film with them. Um, and so we, we interviewed the guy and we interviewed uh, his neighbors and his uh, relatives. Um, about their first memory of the, the, the helicopter. And they all talk about it. Uh, uh, the first encounter was during the Vietnam War. And, um, and for, you know, the rest of, most of his relatives were terrified by the helicopter. <laughs> but for him, he fell in love with the helicopter the first time he saw it. And he was about 10 or 11 years old at that time. Uh, so it was kind of interesting to talk uh, with him about it. Let me show you a quick section of the film. So what, what I decided to do with this work was to kind of provide a platform for them to speak. And sort of using documentary images of the helicopters and, um, and uh, images from Hollywood movies, uh, only a helicopter, and sort of reduce the voice uh, from that uh, from Hollywood or from uh, foreign uh, uh, documentary of the Vietnam War down to just this kind of whirling sound of the helicopter and allow these people to speak about their experience and their, their memory uh, of the Vietnam War because uh, as many of you know uh, throughout uh, the, the uh, kind of Hollywood representation of the Vietnam War, uh, most of the character of the Vietnamese people are either farmers who have no, no lines whatsoever, or we're a shadow in the jungle, or we're prostitute. We have no voice in, in, in all that. So for me to kind of allow these people a kind of uh, a place to uh, the ability to speak, to kind of tell their own story. So the, the film is basically going from their memory of the Vietnam, uh, the, their first memory of the helicopter and their encounters with the helicopter in the Vietnam War to today what their idea of the, of the helicopter is. So the work in a way is about kind of Vietnam desire to move forward to move 
for modernity, for uh, something beyond the Vietnam War. So. quickly about this work uh, because I thought it was it's kind of interesting for you guys to hear my take uh, about Americans approach to the Vietnam War also um, when I was at UC Santa Barbara I took a class called uh, a religious approach to the Vietnam War taught by Wa uh, professor Watercaps, and it was one of the most popular class um, at UCSB and it was featured on 60 Minutes four times. That's how crazy this, this class was. Because it was the first time that America is looking at the, at the Vietnam War from a kind of personal stories by the Vietnam vets, by the American Vietnam vets. So every week they would have um, American vets come in and talk about uh, his experience in Vietnam. And it was extremely emotional. The whole class would cry. And um, I was sitting there and I'm like, where are the Vietnamese? <laughs> uh, you know, it's called the Vietnam War. <laughs> so uh, I got fed up and I went to uh, the professor and I asked him, where are the Vietnamese and where are our stories? Um, and he was a little bit embarrassed. So he said he couldn't find any. And of course I said, well, you know, you know, there's a million Vietnamese migrated to America after the Vietnam War. So that got to be somebody. Uh, anyway, so that, that was quite an interesting uh, experience for me. And I think that sort of also led me to kind of looking at the Vietnam War and try to provide a different perspective of the Vietnam War over the years. But I think what was really interesting for me was the student in that class. They were there not to learn about the Vietnam War. They were there to learn about their father. Many of them were children of Vietnam vets. And they didn't understand their father after he came back from Vietnam. So. I think they were there to sort of try to understand him. And so out of that experience, I make a work that's called From Father to Son, A Rite of Passage. Um, and this is just a, a kind of a, a combination of, um, basically I took two films, Platoon, and Apocalypse Now and strip it down just only with the two main characters, uh, Charlie Sheen and Martin Sheen on the other one. Uh, and I thought it was kind of interesting the how Charlie Sheen follow his father's footstep uh, 10 years later and you know, star in an, uh, a Vietnam War movie like his father. Um, and in a way, I think many you know, in America, there's talk about tradition of going to war. Your father go to war, uh, to, uh, you know, your grandfather go to World War II, your father go to uh, um, 
Korea War and your son go to uh, another war as a tradition. But I think what happened really is this children who go to war in order to kind of sort of understand, trying to learn what their father went through in the previous war. And that I think was kind of interesting to kind of try to make this film uh, to kind of talk about that. But it gets very complicated because again, uh, uh, this is kind of fiction, this is Hollywood. But at the same time, you know, Charlie Sheen and Martin Sheen in real life are, are father and son as well. Uh, the film is showing in the gallery, so uh, you can catch it there. When I was doing research for the, uh, the farmers in a helicopter, I ran into some footages of the last day of the Vietnam War. And it was kind of, for me, it was the quintessential image of America misadventure in Vietnam. Basically, the footages were a helicopter crashing into the sea. Um, helicopter being pushed off the aircraft carrier. Um, and this is the last day of the Vietnam War. So as the communists approaching um, the big city like Saigon and Hue and Da Nang, all this helicopter that America brought to Vietnam were escaping into the South China Sea looking for U.S. aircraft carrier to, uh, um, to, uh, to land and to escape from this um, um, the, the commun advancing communists. So, um, now, if you know that, you know, as I mentioned before, the um, Vietnam War's first helicopter war, but America brought 5,000 helicopter to Vietnam uh, to give them the military advantage that was going to win them the war. This, 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 you know, technology advantage that that they were counting on to win the war, but in the end, you know, it didn't happen. It um, they lost. And at the last day, all this helicopter had to be dumped into the South China Sea. And um, so when I was looking at that, I was thinking about this image, actually. I was thinking about this. Now, Native Americans, uh, before the arrival of the horses, to, but, to hunt the buffaloes, they had to outspark the buffaloes. The buffalo was stronger, faster than the Native Americans, uh, the, the Indians, so they had, they, there was no way they could catch these things. So what they did was they herd them toward a cliff and create a panic and the buffalo just jump off the cliff and into uh, down there and then they just butcher them down there. And so I, I thought about Viet the Vietnam War, about how the communist Vietnamese were, I mean, they, they were fighting with sticks, you know, with, with very little technology and they won. And so, the Vietnamese communist uh, army was able to outsmart the Americans in many ways. So uh, that, that's why the, the title of the piece is called uh, South China Sea Pishkin. Pishkin referred to uh, the cliff where buffalo would be heard off the cliff uh, into the, the, to their death. Uh, the piece is also at the gallery. So, um, <coughs> I think going back again to that idea of providing platform for for voices to be you know to, to be heard. 
Um, in uh, 2011, a uh, documenter invited me to participate in uh, an exhibition there um, uh, in, in Castle. So, um, looking at the history of documenta, and beside Trinh Thi Minh Hà, which is, uh, were invited, she's a Vietnamese American, who was invited to uh, the previous documenta. But the history of 50 years of documenta, there were no Vietnamese uh, were invited. So, looking at that history, I thought, you know, like, uh, Vietnam was not off the map. The, during the 60s and the 70s, we were in everybody's televisions every day. And yet, the curators of this big, giant, important exhibition never thought of inviting a Vietnamese to one of these um, events while everybody else who were invited during that time, the 60s and 70s, uh, were making work about the Vietnam, about, about the Vietnam War, but uh, the curators in, to this kind of exhibition never thought, of, well, maybe we should allow, you know, we should invite the Vietnamese to tell their story instead of allowing, you know, artists from South America, North America to talk about the Vietnam War. So to remedy that, I decided to um, create this exhibition uh, within Documenta uh, and create a film. And I've been collecting this drawing, this war drawings by senior Vietnamese artists who fought on the communist side during the Vietnam War. They were basically soldiers, but along the way they document the war uh, through their drawings and, you know, their, um, uh, when, whatever they can, some have, some able to get access to paper, some uh, able to access to pencil, pen, uh, watercolor sometimes, and they make these amazing, amazing drawings. But at the same time, uh, there's no violence, there's no death, there's no suffering, and I was curious. I, you know, I'm like, were there a directive from the communist government say, you can't show any of that? Were there a kind of agreement somehow? And so I, I set out to interview this artist and create a, um, a kind of exhibition around it with the film of them sort of trying to uh, trying to explain what it means to be an artist in, in this kind of environment, in this context. Uh, and so we, uh, so these are all the artists that uh, were part of this project. Uh, so we went, uh, we went to Hanoi, Saigon, Hue, and we interviewed as many of them as possible. Um, they were all old, uh, very old. Um, some of them die, like one of them, uh, one pass away a month after we interview her. Uh, two already passed away, and so we couldn't interview. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but eventually we were able to interview enough people, uh, enough the, the artists to create this installation and acquire drawings from their, their own personnel collection and uh, create an installation at uh, Documenta. Um, I'll show you a little bit about... Um, I'm going to
mà xem cái gì đó đúng không ví dụ như là cái 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 này đây cái này xem gì đúng không nó là nhật ký không sau một trận đánh kể cả một cái nơi mà không có nước thế mà để lại tìm được một cái nguồn nước thì người lính khoái quá thế nhưng mà cái này là sao mà triển lãm được tôi là hết không ai ra đúng không nó là, là cổ hình thế nên là nhiều năm mình cứ cứ để ở trong ba lô nhưng mà chính bị là như thế này mà mà khơi lên đấy nói chung thì đối với mình thì nó là những cái kỷ niệm nhưng mà đôi khi đôi khi so với lại cuộc sống cái nhân nhu cầu cuộc sống thì thì đôi khi thấy nó cũng 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 tội là nó trở thành dần dần nó trở thành cái chuyện bởi vì người ta cứ bước qua bước qua bước qua cũng như là thử rất nhiều thứ mà cái nãy giờ là mình nói là đối với mình còn đối với cuộc sống thì nó vẫn cứ sang trang sang trang sang trang rồi nó cứ lờ đi Thế có nhiều khi là có khi muốn giữ nhưng mà mình cứ càng ngày càng già đi Tự tranh nó càng ngày càng mục ra Tự tranh thấy nó, nó, nó cứ không hiêu dần, không hiêu dần Thì giá trị khi họ không phải nghĩ nhé, mà chỉ trên cái giấy Mà giá trị khi họ còn có những tác giả, họ không làm vẽ ra cái giấy Nhưng mà nó sống với dung hoa như vẽ cái đó là nhớ tất cả cái giai đoạn Cái thời, cái thời buổi, cái thời sống mà không vẽ ra nó không nhớ lại tất cả cái khung cảnh tất cả cái, cái môi trường luôn luôn quen luôn trên đó cho nên là cái cái nó là một cái chứng cứ thì còn cái hồn tất cả mình không thể nói chiến tranh nó là thế này nó là thế khác hay là chiến tranh đã nói đến chiến tranh thì không có cái đẹp mà mình đã nói đến, đến chiến tranh thì làm sao có cái đẹp được Thế nhưng mà mình, mình, chính câu hỏi của bạn lại, lại đẻ ra một cái là Nhưng mà người nghệ sĩ thì trong cái cái cái, cái, cái ác cái Vẫn này là vẫn nhìn thấy cái mầm thiện của nó Đúng không? Đấy, chính là, là cái đó chứ không phải là là chiến tranh thì trong chiến tranh thì làm sao mà nó lại vẫn có được cái vui được chiến tranh là tàn phá là mất mát là chiến thắng nhưng mà không thể có cái vui được thế nhưng mà cái việc của chúng ta làm thì là phải thấy cái là cái ác ý cái đau khổ ấy đang nảy một cái mầm thiện cái sự chỉ chính ấy cái đó mới là cái việc của anh em mình phải làm Đấy. Tại sao trong các tác phẩm Người ta không muốn thấy có sự Thế như thế có nghĩa là Trong cái ác Luôn luôn vẫn nuôi một cái mầm Và cái, cái, cái mong ước của người ta Về một cái đẹp hơn Về một cái không mất mát hơn Không chết chóc Nó phải có chứ nếu không có thì không có không ai đấu tranh cả đấy có một người tình người nữa không nào anh thì vì sao bị mù đi lấy hiếu anh ta chỉ học được có một năm tình nguyện đi trên đường sau lúc tiến quân vào sài gòn anh ta ngồi trên cái xe tăng ngồi trên cái xe tăng chả biết bị nước mắt thế nào học hai tiếng
không gì không nhìn thấy gì nữa rồi chính là lấy giấy ra lấy máu thì vẽ trên đường bát phổ lấy dư cái này ta bảo đảm quân đội đấy chứ rất là cảm động bước qua chiến thắng xong thì anh ta ra ngoài này mắt thì ngủ mà lúc giờ chừng một giờ đêm rồi thì anh ta cũng có đi tá nào đó để anh ta đi chèo tường bạc mà mưa và chèo tường bạc đi tìm các tài hết bây giờ này anh ta What drew you to photography and and film, like in in the beginning? What was the question again? Can I repeat it for you? Yeah. Um. What What drew him to photography and film? What drew you to photography and film is the question. Sorry. Um. I think when I started out. Photography was a medium that I could sort of identify with. Um, you have, you know, painting and sculpture, which is a very long history of the West. Uh, and I think photography was really new, and it was a sort of global event in a way. It, it spread quite fast around the world, and I think maybe that's why I felt, uh, I, I felt it was easier for me to connect it. Uh, so one, but uh, secondly, uh, I was looking at a lot of Vietnam War photography as well. Um, so I was, uh, well, I start school not as a, as a uh, artist. I was a computer programmer. Uh -huh. uh, a couple of years, so uh, so my 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 interest in uh, photography even started before uh, decided to switch my major to art studio. Uh, I was looking at photography. Uh, I was looking at how uh, Vietnam was being you know, represented with these images. Um, so I think that and the fact that it's a uh, relatively contemporary medium, uh, that those two things that make it, for me, uh, easier to kind of uh, approach somehow, to identify with, mm -hmm. to be able to make it sort of, uh, to, to able to, in a way, claim it uh, uh, for my own. But even then, you know, it wasn't enough. Uh, I, you know, I have to kind of bring in the kind of photo weavings. Uh, as, again, something from my own background, my own history, to make it feel like I have some sort of uh, um, connection to this, this medium as well. So, uh, yeah, so I hope that Oh yeah. answer. Gotcha. Um, your art has such incredible context and meaning for so many people. I was just wondering, who do you make your art for? Me. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I, you have to understand, I left Vietnam when I was 10, and all these crazy events took place and sort of changed my life. You know, like growing up in Vietnam, I never thought I would somehow end up in America. And then, you know, <laughs> coming home back to Vietnam again. Uh, so I, I left Vietnam without understanding 
And so over the years, it's really for me to learn uh, the work, the research I go put into this project is about learning. It's about trying to kind of very get a grasp, uh, some sort of understand of this uh, event that completely changed my life.